Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Walt Hinchin Presbyterian Church. If you're a guest with us, we're excited that you're here. And we're excited in general because we believe that God has a plan for us today. And we look forward to finding out what that is. If you look in your bulletin, you'll see this white insert. And there is a lot going on in terms of meetings, committees, all that this week. Just to name a few, there is a Presbyterian Women's Coordinating Team meeting tomorrow night at 5. Uh, you will see that there is a 4.30 meeting tomorrow for Missions Committee. That is not going to happen. They've changed their format, and in February, they start a new schedule of meeting on the second Sunday uh, of the month. At 6? Oh, that right after church. That's right. The second Sunday right after church for Missions Committee, if you're on that committee. Communications Committee meets Wednesday at 3. WPC Friends is going to be meeting along that time. Personnel Committee, Fellowship Committee, Worship Committee, Christian Action Committee, and even the Evangelism Committee meet all within the span of a week. So we are a, commu a committee-based community, and we believe there's a lot of strength uh, in operating that way. Do we have any other announcements from the congregation? All right, I'll turn it over to Laurie so she can make her announcement. I can't wait for you to hear Jason's sermon today. We heard it in the Connections. It's called, Are You Always Right? And I'm a good example of the fact that, no, I am not always right. And today, I need to tell you about a misprint in the bulletin. On the opening hymn, we have three soloists on stanzas two, three, and four. It says Alan Bonner, Ray Burris, and Wes Veru. And um, the first one, Alan, was willing to do it, but we decided we'd mix it up, and James Hildebrand is going to sing that, so tenors and basses will both be represented. So I wanted to apologize to Alan and to James for not getting that name changed to Rita in time. The second is a note about our anthem today. It's a beautiful text by Howard Thurman, and the title of the anthem is The Work of Christmas, set to music by Dan Forrest. And he says about this piece, I never set a text to music unless it sings to me. For me, some texts are best left alone as poetry. Others eventually sing to me, but only after the song is coaxed out of them. Once in a while, though, a text seems to sing right off the page, and this poem did just that. It's not going to end the way you would expect, though, and that is very purposeful on the composer's part. So see what you think and what you feel.
Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. The glory of God shines in the darkness. Lift up your eyes and look around. Follow the star wherever it leads. Take a journey that leads to the child. Let your hearts rejoice. Be overwhelmed with joy. We worship the Christ child.
Jesus Christ, God has revealed the mystery that brings grace and forgiveness. The light of God's love transforms us so that we may act with boldness and confidence. Stand, all right, and you can sing your number. No, that's not. Wait a minute. Okay, wait a minute. That's. I think I got that wrong. I'm sorry, Laurie. You guys have a seat. Wait a minute. It's time for the children's sermon. That's what we're doing here. Yay! Children's sermon. The easy one. Yay! Hey, do you, do you ever get things wrong? Yeah. Yeah, it's easy to get things wrong. It really is. And when we get things wrong, a lot of times we feel like we're just not very smart. Or maybe we're not as good as the other people around us. Hey, well, and sometimes that helps the people around you feel better about themselves. Today what we're learning is that we always will get it wrong. That's just who we are. We are the kind of people who will always get it wrong. Because we're not perfect. We don't know everything about life. They say practice makes perfect, and we don't get to practice at life. But this is the thing. We are learning that even though we mess up, God loves us so much. And so that's the message for today. No matter what you do, God loves you very, very much. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for these kids. We thank you that they are learning. They are learning about this life that you've given them. We ask that you would give them confidence when they make mistakes. To know that they are so valuable to you and to the people around you. 
We love them. And we appreciate them. In Christ's name, amen. praising God for Maggie Hughes and Liz Caruso's friendship as she took them to spend some time together on Friday. Another praise report. All right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. To be able to get out and to get out and spend time with God's people. Praise. What else is God doing in your life? Yeah. Um, John's sister Christine is now walking with a walker to be filled with seven holes in a wheelchair. John Brackett's sister is getting stronger, walking with a walker. That's a praise. One year cancer free for Angie Moss. What a praise. God is at work in the people around us. 
and the people around us need God to be at work, who would we like to lift up this morning to God? Our federal, our federal workers during the shutdown, that financially, that, that they would find direction, okay? Safe Harbor, which is a organization, a nonprofit that, that serves abused children. Rita Robinson, you may have heard that Rita is dealing with uh, cancer, and so and she's looking at her options. Um, but Rita is a dear person here in our congregation, and so let's lift her up together. that we would like to lift up. In the pressure of the moment, his last name has slipped my mind. Jones. Please repeat that, Jason. Harvey Jones is undergoing treatment, and he's, it, he is uh, going to be going through both two styles of treatment, uh, radiation and chemo, I think that's right, this week. Okay, what's Julian's last name? C. We have a lot of work to do, don't we? Together, we have a lot of concerns. So, we're going to pray together in the same likeness of mind, as though these people we are lifting up are ourselves, or our 
very closest loved ones. We'll pray for them as if they were us. Let's pray. Lord, we turn our hearts and our minds to you together. And if we were in any of these people's situation, we would rest easier knowing that you were watching, that you were planning, and that you were working. And so together we lift up the federal workers who are uh, wondering about how income's going to work for you. We ask God that you would give them direction and help them to see uh, where they have a little bit of wiggle room in terms of resources. We ask that you would give them good budgeting minds. We lift up Lacey Elliott to you as she's working with the Safe Harbor Organization, the nonprofit focused on abused and neglected people. Lord, we ask that you would reveal Lacey's, or reveal your, your call to Lacey. We ask that you would help her to see why she's there and what she's doing, help her to be efficient as she works in that program. We lift up Rita Robinson to you. We ask God that you would be at work in her heart and mind, uh, even, even now. We ask that you would give her wisdom and direction as she thinks through uh, this new situation in her life with her health. We ask God that you would bring her to wholeness and to healing. And we lift her family up as they walk with her through this process. We ask that you would give them wisdom. We lift up Dr. Bird to you as he is beginning a treatment. Well, we, we ask that you would bring his body back to wholeness. We ask that you would guide the folks working with him, that everything would be done meticulously. We ask the same for Harvey Jones, as he is about to embark on a lot of treatment. But we, we ask that you would give him courage. We ask that you would let him know right now that you are with him and you have a plan for his life. We lift up Brenda's sister, Judy, in her recent heart attack. Lord, we ask that you would uh, be at work in Judy's life. We ask that you would give Brenda the words and the energy that she needs to be there for her sister. We lift up Juliana C., who lost her son. And as she is mourning and can't find the way forward, we ask God that you would reveal the way forward to her. We ask that you would help her to go through this mourning process in a healthy way. And if it were any one of us, we wouldn't know what to do if we were in her shoes. So we lift her up to you this morning. We lift up Mary Mode as our people are reminded about ministry that John did here. Well, we lift her up and we ask that you would give her a sense of comfort this morning and a sense of joy as she reflects on the years that she had with John. We ask that you would bless that family in honor of him. We lift up the young lady that Linda mentioned with the health condition. Lord, we ask that you would give her a way out. We ask that you would help her to see the way forward as she looks at her life. We ask God that you help her to believe that you're there and that you have a plan for her. We lift her up to you. As we pray in faith together, we want to pray out loud together in the way that our Lord said that we should. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
Let's continue in prayer together. Lord, in this time when we turn to your word, we ask that you would shine your light into our hearts and minds. We thank you for your word. We're listening for you even now. In Christ's name, amen. So the scripture for today is very long. In fact, um, my guess is if I read it to you, I will probably lose you. Uh, so what I want to do is read it to you in a version that I think you're going to love. Okay. This is the message. If you're not familiar with the message, uh, it was created uh, through the work of Eugene Peterson, a Presbyterian pastor. And Eugene Peterson and his group of people took about 10 years, and they used the, uh, the earliest sources that we have, and they went through and they rewrote first the New Testament and then the Old. But they rewrote the Scripture so that it would be understandable by the most contemporary people. And you'll see as I read it that it's a little easier to listen to. But you can read along uh, in, your, in your Bible and, and you'll, you'll hear. Here we go. The secret plan of God. Ephesians 3, verses 1 through 13. This is why I, Paul, am in jail for Christ, having taken up the cause of you outsiders, so-called. I take it that you're familiar with the part I was given in God's plan for including everybody. I got the inside story on this from God himself, as I just wrote you in brief. As you read over what I've written to you, you'll be able to see for yourselves into the mystery of Christ. None of our ancestors understood this. Only in our time has it been made clear by God's Spirit through his holy apostles and prophets of this new order. The mystery is that people who have never heard of God and those who have heard of him all their lives stand on the same ground before God. They get the same offer, same help. Same promises in Christ Jesus. The message is acceptable and welcoming to everyone across the board. This is my life work, helping people understand and respond to this message. It came as a sheer gift to me, a real surprise. God handling all the details. When it came to presenting the message to people who had no background in God's way, I was least qualified of any of the available Christians. God saw to it that I was equipped, but you can be sure that it had nothing to do with my natural abilities. This is the Apostle Paul talking. Not me. And he goes on to say, and so here I am preaching and writing about things that are way over my head. The inexhaustible riches and generosity of Christ. My task is to bring out in the open and make plain what God, who created all this in the first place, has been doing in secret and behind the scenes all along. Through followers of Jesus like yourselves gathered in churches, this extraordinary plan of God is becoming known and talked about even among the angels. All this is proceeding along lines planned all along by God and then executed in Christ Jesus. When we trust in him, we're free to say whatever needs to be said, bold to go wherever we need to go. So don't let my present trouble on your behalf get you down. Be proud. This is the word of God for God's people. Thanks be to God. I wasn't kidding, was I? That was a long passage. And there's so much good in this passage that I hope that I can get it right. You guys always right? <coughs> Anybody in here? Always right? Whenever Marilyn asked, what's the sermon title? And I said, are you always right? I thought, you know, even if people don't even come to the service on Sunday morning and they answer the question to themselves, are you always right? They might take one step in a better direction. You know, because the moment we can say, look, I'm not always right. You know, we, we make a good step in the right direction. But what's it mean? If you're not always right, 
Does that mean that you're not good enough? Maybe that depends on what you do wrong. You know, if, if I don't get it right when it comes to how well my tie matches my shirt, well, that's one thing. But what if you don't get it right when it comes to something big, like parenting? Or what if you don't get it right when it comes to your marriage or your career? And when we make decisions and we're wrong, especially about things like that, we tend to carry them with us, don't we? There are consequences. At my house, we teach about consequences. Because guess what? My kids don't always get it right. And when they don't, they're punished. In some way, they're punished when they don't get it right. You can't have this now because you did this. But in time, I wonder if they grow up to be adults who maybe connect consequences and the way their life is going with something that they did in the past. Have you ever met someone who did something in the past and maybe they believe that they have to work it off, they have to pay penance, they have to be some other kind of person to try to correct the wrongs that they've done? At my house, my children know what to do when it comes to getting what they want. When they have a request to make, and they've done some wrong things in the past, they have learned some effective ways to still get what they want. So, for instance, our, my 12-year-old, you know, Sophie, she has learned that a very effective way of convincing Dad to pay attention to her is to write a note. And so maybe she wants to, you know, do something with me or with a friend. And so I go into the bathroom where she knows I'll be at some point in time during the day. And there on the counter will be a note. These are my notes, but actually it will be a note. And I'll look at it, and the note usually sounds something like this. Father, it has come to my attention that we no longer spend the afternoon together. And seeing as how I am 10 years old and won't be forever, I suggest that you consider, you know, and on and on and on. And actually, she's learned that that does a really good job of softening me up somewhat like a defrost mode. So that when she sees me, she's already, you know, kind of got one foot in the game. You know? It works. And then I think about Ruby, our next down, and, and Ruby is a tiny little thing. And she has learned that if she wants something, the work that she has to do is something like this. She'll come into the room. She'll make sure that her voice goes up about 10 octaves. And then she begins to repeat and bounce. Daddy, 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 daddy. Please, 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 daddy, daddy. Please, please, this, 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 this. And she's learned that that will eventually just chip me down <laughs> to where... I begin to listen. She puts, she works hard, and she does good. And she usually wins. Now, Valerie has learned that the work that she has to do is a little different. And it's fascinating to me how efficient it is. Because this is what Valerie does. If you know Valerie, she's, she's uh, our six-year-old. And she has curly hair and, and big blue eyes. And I don't know how she learned to do this. But... She will come into the room with the most somber look on her face. I'm washing dishes, you know, at the sink. And she will come into the room with tears hanging just at the edge of her eyes. Big tears hanging just at the edge. And as she walks up, I'll be, I, I won't know what to say. Honey, what's, what's wrong? Did, did you run into the door jam? What's wrong? And then she'll say, you're just going to say no, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> then the tears did, on cue, the tears roll down. <laughs> and I say, what, 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 what is it? Can I have ice cream? <laughs> I said, it's 8.30 in the morning. You don't need ice cream. But by this point, she's already halfway there. She's done the work. 
Henry's young and he's not learned to manipulate in the same way. He's three years old. And so Henry's pretty face value. He comes and asks for something and doesn't take it personal usually whenever you say no. He just says, okay. And he bounces out. With adults, when we get it wrong, a lot of times we feel like we can't come back. We feel like we have to in some way work. You ever, you ever went to pray for something, to ask God for something, maybe on behalf of yourself, and feel like you've got to put in some work before you can go and ask God? I mean, look at who you are. Look what you said just five minutes ago. You said that, and now you want to come and ask God for something? And so what do we do? We work. We walk around. I've, I've found myself time and again walking around. Okay. How do I pray about this? How do I bring this to the Lord? How do I get myself together and make sure that whenever I pray about this, I've got a good fighting chance? And that is self-righteousness, isn't it? We work to make ourselves better. And in doing that, we completely miss what Paul is talking about even here. You can never be in God's favor, you think. So we become the kind of people who feel like we got to work for it. But I'm here to tell you, just like Paul, that God loves you today, right now, sitting in your pew, sitting in your chair. God loves you dearly. When I think about the love that I have for my children and then consider that God loves me exponentially more, that God loves you exponentially more, just like you are. There is no amount of work that you can do to make God love you less or more. Paul even goes on to say that we are free to say what needs to be said. Free to go where we need to go. And oftentimes we feel like we don't have the right words. We don't have the right experience. We don't have the right amount of time. But those things are so far from the truth. He says, Here I am, preaching and writing about things that are way over my head. The inexhaustible riches and generosity of Christ. When we think about first century Rome, and the world that Paul lived in, there was a lot going on in terms of philosophy. That first century was rich with Greek philosophy. But really, the majority of history remembers this guy and his argument. And who does he say he was? He says he was the least of all the people who could have been chosen. He got it wrong the most, he says. Why would God pick me? My task is to bring out in the open and make plain what God who created all things in the, in the first place, has been doing in secret and behind the scenes all along. Through followers of Jesus like yourselves gathered in churches, this extraordinary plan of God becoming known and talked about even among the angels. All of this proceeding along lines planned all along by God and then executed in Christ Jesus. The in Christ Jesus part is very important for us. Because oftentimes, the reason we're working so hard to look good, to be right, to please God, is because we have forgotten that when we are in Christ, that is when we are made whole. How many times have I been in Christ and I look back at my life and said, How in the world did that happen? I am so wanting. I am so lacking. I think about all the blessings that God has given me. And I say, how could that have ever happened for me? Well, the, the way it happened is I was in Christ in the moment. How did I have those words at that moment when that person was it, at the store and now this new relationship is mending? I was in Christ. Walking in faith, believing that I am good enough. Because of Christ. When we trust in him, we're free to say whatever needs to be said. Bold to go wherever we need to go. 
That conversation that you need to have, think about it. The conversation that you need to have. The relationship that needs to be fixed. The new journey that's in front of you. You might think, I don't have what it takes. And if you do, you're absolutely right. You don't. But if you are in Christ, then Christ will go ahead of you. God will go ahead of you. God will lead you and take care of you. In closing, I think about the uh, thief on the cross. Think about the guy that died beside Jesus. Do you think he was always right? I mean, when it comes to the poster child of who we would like to, to identify with, do we identify with the thief on the cross beside Jesus? What got him there? You know? He was probably a, a pretty bad character. And just as the thread was about to snap, here he is beside Christ. And he prays, or he speaks to him. And he says, remember me when you're in your kingdom. And when Jesus looks over at him, what does he see? Does he see this? No. But he sees one who is in faith, spoken and reached out. And he responds, he says, today you will be with me in paradise. And my guess is whenever we go to heaven... However that works. So we, we, you know, we may actually walk up to a gate. I'm not sure. But we often think in life that when we walk up to the gate, we will see, I don't know, John Calvin, Charles West, I don't know, uh, Paul Tillich, or Karl Barth. That's a good theologian I'm learning about in the seminary. That they will be there with their coat and tie and shaking hands, welcome to heaven. But you know, I doubt it will be that way because they know nothing in comparison to that snaggletooth thug who the gate almost shut and it didn't. And he was right completely in Christ, suitable and welcomed. And maybe when we go to that gate, that's who we'll see. That is the one who will be respected because they know more about grace than a thousand theologians. In Christ, you are ready. You are right. You are worthy. So as you go out into the world this week, go out with confidence, believing the good news. That you don't have to do anything as a child of God except open your heart to the love of Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's stand now and read the affirmation of faith. The Apostles' Creed. Page 35 in your hymnal. As we read this together today, let's read this knowing that we're a community of people who are not right and who are in need of God's love and grace. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into
rejoice that we are in a place to give. We ask that as we take these gifts and go out into the world, that the people that we meet might come to know about your love. For your glory and for theirs. In Christ's name, amen.